my name is Kevin Hale. I'm a senior product manager over at SurveyMonkey. We're based uh, primarily out of Silicon Valley and also here in Portland where most of our customer support is based. Um, my expertise is in user experience design, hum human computer interaction, and front end engineering. Uh, although I do have a background in writing, uh, I studied modern American literature, some journalism, and uh, a bunch of weird sort of hippie interactive classes. I'm here to talk about um, a company I founded called Wufu. It's an online form builder, helps you create contact forms, design online surveys, power event registrations like these, and process simple online payments. Uh, basically, it's a Microsoft Access that's web-based, um, but it looks like it's designed by Fisher Price. So <laughs> what, what makes it really nice is that it makes it easy for like anyone to use. And what that means is that we are used by Everyone you can think of, every industry, vertical, and mar market utilizes Wufu, including a number of name brands that you probably heard of. In April of 2011, we were acquired by SurveyMonkey, and we were an interesting outlier in terms of companies that were acquired during that period. This is a graph that was put out by TunCrunch at the time, and on one axis, we have the amount of funding that was set up that was taken by the companies, and on the other axis is the worth of the company at acquisition or IPO. And we're this far outlier to the far left over there. And basically, to sum it up, the average startup takes $25.3 million and returns to their investors 676%. Wufu, oh, hold up. <laughs> Wufu took $118,000 in funding and returned back to our investors 29,561%. What's sort of amazing about this is at the time that we were acquired, we were only about 10 people. And what's interesting about this team is every single person here wrote documentation. Um, and it's not just internal documentation, but user-facing documentation. And this team composes of designers, developers, engineers. We have our bookkeeper and um, some dedicated support people. And the secret, the way I sort of see it, is that we had everyone all primarily focused on giving excellent customer support, which we made everyone sort of do. And what I mean by customer support is at the time, we had about 500,000 users on Wufu. And on Wufu, people would be filling out a form or using one of the reports, whether they do it or not. And that audience was about 5 million people, and we supported all of them. And it resulted in about 400 issues a week, 800 emails a week that was sent out by us. And our average response time was 7 to 12 minutes, from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m., and from 9 p.m. to midnight, it was an hour. And then on the weekends, you wouldn't go longer than 24 hours. And we did this all with a team of 10 supporting people all around the world. So the secret has to do with the way we set up the culture of our company. I've heard a lot of people talking about we have to create a culture of doc, of getting people to appreciate documentation, to appreciate the work that we do. And I know that my background and my primary role at the company is not technical writer, but I'm a big fan of the work that you guys do. I know that all of you in your hearts kind of believe that your company would kind of suck without you, right? <laughs> and for us, getting people to that point where they understand and value documentation and customer support is sort of a long journey and had to do with sort of how we sort of set out about sort of creating the company. So when we first started, we knew we didn't want to create any kind of software. We wanted to create software people wanted to have a relationship with that didn't remind them that they worked inside of a cubicle. And in fact, we were fanatical about this, almost to sort of a weird method, uh, methodical and sort of scientific way. And what we did was we said, we looked at how real human relationships work, sort of in the real world, and we said, we'll just apply that metaphor uh, sort of literally. So we approached new users as if we were trying to date them and existing users as if it was an existing marriage. And we took sort of the best that science had to offer about those two subjects and then applied it to sort of how we approach building out our company and our product and how we approach the culture of the company. Now, uh, typically in this presentation, I sp split about 50-50% covering both topics, but, but since the meat of what we're sort of interested in today is in the second, we're just sort of take a cursory look at sort of the first stuff. When it comes to dating, first impressions make all the difference. If you're on a first date with someone and you catch them sort of picking their nose over in the middle of dinner, that date is probably over. You won't be seeing that person again. But if you're married to someone for 30 years and you catch them on the barking lounger digging for gold, you don't immediately call up your lawyer and file for divorce, right? You shrug your shoulders and go, eh, he's got the heart of gold or whatever. We'll figure it out. <laughs> 
<laughs> There's something about the start of a relationship where tolerance is very, very low. And so how you help people create the origin story, the word of mouth story of how they're going to talk about your product makes all the difference. Now, the typical first impressions for most startups that everyone sort of focuses on are these sort of typical ideas. But I believe that great products think about first moments in lots of other different ways. For example, there's the first email. What happens if you don't have anything created in your account? The login link, the very first time you interact with customer support. And so here's a few, well, let me actually go over this. Um, when I talk about building a great first impression, I actually look to the Japanese to try to figure out um, how do we take it to the next level. So the Japanese actually have two words for quality when they talk about building things. There's atarime hinshitsu and there's miryokuteki hinshitsu. Atarime means matter of fact, taken for granted quality. It means that basically it's functional. The pen that I have, it writes on a piece of paper and creates sort of ink to it. Midio Kateki has to do with sort of embodying objects that we create with an enchanting quality. So for example, the weight of the pen is both pleasing to me, the way the ink flows out is pleasing in terms of how it writes onto the piece of paper, and then the way that people sort of read that ink, that writing that I've, write, that I've written with, is also pleasing to the reader as well. So I'll give you a couple of examples. So uh, in Wufu, we have a login link. It is a dinosaur that accompanies it. And um, one of the things that's not written in the spec is that when you hover over it, it's going to do this. <laughs> right? Something that just makes you smile and sort of think like, OK, this is going to be a little bit different. Sometimes you can do it with copy alone. Uh, this is the sign-up form for a social networking site called Cork back in the day for wine enthusiasts. And this is um, how it reads. Email address. It's also your sign and name. It has to be legit. First name, what mom calls you, last name, what your army buddies call you, password, something you remember but hard to guess, password confirmation. Try it again. Think of it as a test. It's literally a poem as you fill out this form, which is sort of really nice and sort of sets the tone. In contrast, this is Yahoo sign-in form. <laughs> One of the sad things about this form was that it actually changed Flickr's original sign-in form, which was one of my favorite sort of call to actions, which was, get in there. So the quicker that you use to convert users uh, can be something that sort of sets an enchanting quality about it. This is a text editor called Chocolat. It has my favorite upgrade trigger of all time. Um, when your trial, exp uh, trial period expires, all the features keep working, except you are forced to use Comic Sans from that point forward. <laughs> This is a website called Hurl, and um, they help you test and process HTTP requests, but if you hit a 404, this is theirs. <laughs> yeah. So Kathy Sierra, who's one of my favorite sort of writers, she used to keep a blog called Creating Passionate Users, and one of the articles she wrote about is saying, we should have marketing design the user manuals. She talked about why is there such a disconnect between um, the promotional materials that we have for the technical products that we build, and then the actual documentation that we have for them. It's not sexy, it's not as enchanting, and it's not as appealing. And um, MailChimp does a really good job of this. This is their resources section. And what they did was they designed these incredible book covers for every single one of the little help docs and tutorials that shows how to use MailChimp in a lot better way. And what ended up happening is readership for all of these documentation went up as a result. Sometimes you can do things with code. Um, this is the API documentation for Stripe. It's one of my favorite API docs. And this is a company that's just being an API gateway. And one of the things that they do is they say, in their documentation, there's all these examples of code where you have to sort of put your API key. Well, if you're logged into Stripe, then what they do is they actually replace all the places where the API key goes, and they put it right inside of the documentation. So all of these code snippets are literally copy and pasteable right into your projects without having to do any additional extra work. Some extra step that just shows that they sort of care. A couple years ago, when we rewrote uh, the third version of our documentation, or not documentation, rewrote our API, the third version of it, um, 
We built out all these beautiful new docks for it, and we felt like this was a way of integrating and building on top of the Wufu platform that was better than it has ever been. And one of the interesting things about API doc documentation, or APIs in general, is that it's all documentation. That's basically all that you sort of give to developers. And we wanted to make sure that the work that we put into it actually got sort of uh, the attention and sort of the adoption that it deserves. So in our company, we are very big medieval nuts. Every year, we take our entire company out to medieval times on the anniversary of the, of the starting of the company. And we decided that in the spirit of our interests, what we were going to do was have an API contest. And instead of just giving out iPhones and iPads or what have you, what we're going to do is contact some people from armor.com and forge us a custom battle axe. And therefore... <laughs> If you win our API contest, you will win a medieval weapon. You can tell we're a small company without like a legal department. <laughs> but everything worked out great. We had over 25 applications built on top of the API, tons of word of mouth, and sort of like viral marketing that happened without any extra work of our own, just because we tried to think of things and build out on top of our documentation in an interesting way. We had things like an excellent iPhone app, an Android app, and a WordPress plugin, things that we couldn't have paid people on the time scale that we had um, for the quality that we saw because it generated a story for people that was um, surprising and engaging. There are tons of examples of Medioka uh, in applications. Uh, a really good blog to follow a lot of these is called Little Big Details, where they just cover little things that software does that sort of help make people's lives a little bit better and someone just happened to notice. Now, in terms of existing users and um, dealing with long-term relationships, the person to go to for this research is John Gottman. He's actually based up in Seattle. And what he does is he studies marriages. He's been featured in This American Life and uh, Malcolm Gladwell's books. And he can do an interesting trick. He can watch a videotape of a couple fighting about something for 15 minutes and with an 85% probability project whether that couple would be together or not four years down the road. Now, if they videotape them for up to an hour, prediction rating goes up to 94%. Now, they would show these exact same videotapes to sociologists, psychologists, successfully married couples, priests, et cetera, and they can't predict better than random chance. So there's something about what John Gottman understands about relationships and looking at the way we fight with one another that determines longevity. Now, one of the surprising things he discovered was not that successfully married people don't fight at all. It turns out everyone fights, and we all fight about the exact same things. They are money, kids, sex, time, and other. And other are things like jealousy and the in-laws. <laughs> but um, what's interesting is that in a long-term relationship or marriage, uh, divorce is basically the equivalent of churn in a business. <laughs> and so you can map all of these characteristics to their corresponding counterparts. Right? So the, when we're complaining about the price of objects or my credit card expiring, or anything that affects our users' clients. People are very sensitive about those um, issues uh, in regards to sex performances, uh, how long you're up and how fast. And, <laughs> and I said jealousy and in-laws for others, which really corresponds to competition and partnerships. Anything that weird that happens there, you'll see customer support for them. Now, what's interesting is that in your typical conversion funnel, uh, what you ultimately want people to do is sort of slide through all the different barriers that gets them to the next step that sort of ultimately makes you money. This is sort of the economic engine of every sort of typical freemium software product. But customer support is the things that happen in between every single one of these steps. It's the thing, the indicator that lets us know that something is wrong with the funnel and something that has to sort of be lubricated either through customer support or documentation. So how did we deal with fighting in our company? at Wufu. Well, um, the founders and I noticed a pattern that we saw in a lot of other software companies, and it was that software engineers and designers, the people who build the products, are divorced from the consequences of their actions. It's a broken feedback loop. And this has to do with sort of the way every company is sort of started, especially if they're started by technical co-founders. So before launch, um, we've got three guys who are probably building something 
incredible. And they're in this process of just building something new. It's all pure creation, and it's sort of a wonderful moment where everything you do, you feel like God, and you can do no wrong. After launch, we start having to deal with um, a lot of other things. And usually the attitude, especially of technical co-founders who love to build things, is to say, time to start dividing up the company, splitting things apart, and having that not be part of my problem anymore. Not realizing that the entire role of the company or the thing that what makes a sort of business sort of work is all those other things working in concert with one another. So for us, we felt like software development was broken and we needed to sort of add three characteristics to it or to make sure that it was always at this forefront. Responsibility, accountability, and humility. And the way we did it is simple. And we created an acronym sort of like how everyone else has done. Um, it's called Support Driven Development. And it's just like test-driven development or any sort of agile practice that you've seen. It's a way of designing and building software so that it is higher quality when it goes out to our users. It's a way of figuring out high QA values. And the way you sort of make it work is simple. You just make everyone do customer support. And therefore, you fix the feedback loop so that the creators become the supporters. And what ends up happening is they can't sort of ignore the things that cause most of you grief. So what happens when you make everyone responsible for doing customer support every single week and it has to be remarkable? Well, this is the graph of Wufu for the first four years. That's our user graph. We paid no money towards traditional marketing methods, no advertising, no SEO, no what have you. All of this is through word of mouth growth. Now, this other graph that I included on here is that same time span as in regards to what our support growth is. Lots of companies focus on and sort of obsess about like how do we build out our technology and, and scale out our company to account for this kind of user growth. But for us, in a company where we expected and wanted profit sharing to be sort of the primary motivations for everyone in the company, we had to think about the thing that is the hardest to scale is the thing that requires individual human bodies. And so this is the graph, this linear only growth of customer source, the one I'm most proud of. So there's a couple of surprising sort of insights that we discovered from uh, everyone doing customer support. And the first one is that sport responsible builders give the best customer support, and that should be no surprise. And one of the best examples of this comes from another company called Kayak.com. Paul English, who was one of the founders, installed a phone in the engineering department. And basically, customer support calls would come in through there. And people have asked him, why would you pay engineers $150,000 a year to answer customer phone calls. And he goes, well, after the second or third ring of that phone of the exact same problem, the engineer was sort of stop what they're doing, fix the problem, <laughs> and you don't get phone calls for it anymore. <laughs> but sort of the best way to sort of help people, sort of help them help themselves. And so at Wufu, we spend tons of time doing things like tool tips all over the application. Simple little things like if you click the help tab, depending on where you are in the application, it takes you to the documentation for that specific help. We spent lots of times iterating and A-B testing our documentation. This current iteration resulted in a 30% drop in customer support overnight. Major parts of it having to do with just adding lots of screenshots, lots of screencasts, building in ways of logical and simple navigation, and then, yes, actually lots of FAQ, so it makes it easily searchable when people are doing natural language search. We also have general FAQs all over the page. We have ways of highlighting the most important parts of the FAQ answer in case they don't have time to read the whole thing, even though it's only a paragraph. And we have things where our accountant who wrote documentation, we created a page for her called wufu.com slash charge. So what they would see on the billing charge of the credit card bill would be wufu.com slash charge instead of saying this is by wufu, which a lot of people in the finance department of their company probably didn't know about. People would go to that URL and they'll see something like this, which clearly explains sort of what needs to be done there and why they should not cancel the charge that was associated with it. One of the things that we noticed um, after we released wufu.com slash charge was that some banks clip out the number of characters for the URL, like our URL was too long. So this also works as if you remove the E in charge, the G in charge, and the R in charge. 
also goes to this page. One of the cool things, though, is when you have engineers doing customer support is they do experiments. They can't help themselves because they have the ability to do so. And we saw a talk by Kathy Sierra also at a conference called Future of Web Apps, and she talked about that there's a disconnect in terms of the tone of customer support and then the feelings people have when they come to it. And she says that for as long as we don't have face recognition, we won't be able to have true empathy with our users. We are a form building company and we couldn't build face recognition software, but we can add drop downs. So that's what we did. <laughs> so what we did was just ask them, hey, what is your emotional state? We didn't make it required and our hypothesis was no one was going to fill that out, but we just wanted to see what would happen. And the results are interesting. The emotional state drop down, which was optional, was filled out 75.8% of the time. <laughs> What's even more interesting is the browser type dropdown, which is crucial for helping us debug your problem, is only filled out 78.1% of the time. <laughs> the thing that should be understood, though, is that people were basically telling us how I feel about my technical support problem is basically just as important to me as it should be to you, the kind of technology that I'm using to use your software some more stats about it. We found out that if you don't triage based on the emotional state, people don't game the system. And for the most part, people were pretty honest about it. Most people just being sort of confused and we sort of figure things out from there. The other thing that's sort of surprising that most people don't know is the support responsible developers and designers actually create better software, right? A lot of people might think that, hey, if I'm dedicating all this time to doing customer support, when am I going to have time to build the software. Well, it turns out you actually do it a whole lot better. And there's been studies that proves this. This is a study done by User Interface Engineering, the premier institute for doing usability studies. Jared Spool, the head of User Interface Engineering, wrote that time spent directly exposed to users interacting with designs correlated strongly with improvements in the design of the software. And he said, there's only a certain way that this exposure has to happen. It has to be direct exposure to the customers. It has to be a minimum of every six weeks. And it has to be for at least two hours. Anything less than this, and then your software gets worse and worse over time. Our team was getting exposed to about four to eight hours of customer support every single week. And in 2008, we were actually voted by Jacob Nielsen, one of the gurus of usability, one of the top 10 best application UIs that year. We beat out teams filled with millions of dollars in their coffers dedicated to usability studies. The last thing that I am pleasantly surprised at was that support responsible developers and designers Respect the people who do customer support. For the first two years of our company, it was just the three founders building out the software, writing the documentation, and doing the customer support. When we finally hired two engineers, we did not hire a support person. And so those two people also did customer support. And so by the time, after I think two employees later, after that, we hired our first dedicated support person, that person was the most revered, respected, and appreciated person inside of the company. <laughs> Because everyone knew what his job entailed, and they respected that that was what he would be primarily doing. And so what you end up having is engineers who empathize with sort of the task at hand and start building out tools to sort of make things happen. In our company, we kept the tools simple. We just used the shared Gmail account across all of us to do the customer support. However, we built over 15 different applications, internal tools that help do this customer support, to help do the marketing and help people who have to do this every single day, which is every single person in the company, handle and access these things a whole lot better. I'm gonna wait for an interface to show up here. This is the more sort of main builder, sort of access people's account and stuff. 30% of our time was spent on internal tools. Some of the best software we created for Wufu was software that our users never got to use themselves. Because we use the shared Gmail account, we actually also wrote a Gmail Grease Monkey plugin. So what ends up happening is, when you open your Gmail account, we will write this, this JavaScript software that will sort of parse the emails that were set inside of there, then go into our internal tools admin section and sort of pull all this interesting data so we have a shortcut into all sort of internal access and sort of help debug their issues. The other thing that we start doing is we start trying to figure out what are ways that we can help customer support and the people who write documentation do a better job. 
And so the team um, that I led to help sort of redesign and rebuild SurveyMonkey's survey design tool, we asked them, what do you need to help make the documentation a whole lot better? Because we want our tool to be the best that there is. So let me see here what this is. Hold on. Um, so one of them is that these are uh, some mocks of all the help pop-ups that we wanted to add into the tool. This is just some of them. And one of the things that we noticed that maintaining the help pop-ups, all the tool tips inside of the application, was really, really tedious. It was difficult, basically, because the place where, and this is sort of the documentation that we have set up for our design patterns ins inside of the company, the way you set up a tool tip is you just copy, paste the HTML snippet for the tool tip right in the place where you want it to go. And therefore, all over the app, you have tooltips sprinkled all throughout, and therefore when you file a t ticket to say, I need to update this tooltip, tool it's very difficult to go and find these sort of tooltips. You have to wait for an engineer to go and find it and do it and figure things out. And the person who's most passionate about sort of updating these tooltips, um, we make it difficult for them. So what we did was we rewrote um, the help tooltip so it could be set up with macros. And what we set up was, let me see here, a way that we can consolidate. So that way what you can do is you put placeholder inside of all of the code, and then this is all of the tooltips put into one single file. So that way our technical writers can easily look at them, parse them, copy edit them, without having to come back to us to have to answer and figure things out. And they see a good view of it. What you'll notice here is just for the survey designer, there's over 70 tooltips. Basically documentation is baked into this software. The other thing we found out was that the tooltips, when you click on the different sections, the way they wanted to rewrite the documentation, currently everything was sort of based on this sort of um, task-based answer system. So every little thing that I want to do, like how do I create a new survey, and then there'd be answer just for that instead of creating sort of this overall hierarchy of the documentation. Um, if they wanted to create this giant hierarchy, it was hard for people to jump into sort of the documentation stuff without feeling lost in terms of how things were set up. So we wrote some scripts for them so that if you click on a link into the documentation and it goes into a deeper part of the page, it'll actually scroll you sort of nicely and highlight the part of the documentation that you're looking at. And it doesn't scroll you to the very top of the page. We just added some simple JavaScript tooltips. It didn't take very much time for our engineers, but it makes all the difference in terms of interacting and playing with these documentation. The other thing that we've discovered was that um, they weren't doing screenshots in SurveyMonkey for their documentation because we had a translation sort of system. And it was difficult to have the images of um, the different languages uh, set up to be done. And so because the system that they had initially had set up with couldn't support multiple languages for the screenshots, it was better to not having to begin with just because of the technical hurdle. So our team went and just wrote some simple JavaScript. And what we set it up to do is that class names would be set up so that in English only, or you can specify the language type of the images, so that way they would show inside of the documentation for English, which is most of our users' sort of primary demographic, and then uh, not show for people who aren't. And then we'd write the documentation so that would refer to the screenshots directly. But the result is we have over 100 screenshots for our survey designer alone. And I know our documentation would be so much worse if we hadn't written this code to allow them to be placed inside of those docs. The last thing to know about long-term relationships that John Gottman sort of discovered was that he noticed the pattern. He said there are some couples that would break up in four years, and he could predict them very, very accurately. But there was this other group of people who were breaking up. What they would do is none of the uh, traditional indicators he discovered were there. And they would be together for about 15, 10 years. And then eventually, after the kids go to college, they'd break up. And he couldn't figure it out. And after a while, it took him some time, and he discovered that these people had no spark. And it turns out that relationships kind of follow the second law of thermodynamics. In a closed energy system, things tend to run down. You have to constantly be putting energy back into it. So in our company, we did the traditional ways of trying to get people to understand that we were doing things for them constantly. We kept the blog. We had an email newsletter. But only 5% of people were subscribed to the blog, and about 30% of people only opened the emails. And so you knew there was this disconnect in terms of all the hard work we were doing and the knowledge that people had about the work that we were doing. So one of the tools that we built later on is called a internal sort of alert system. And what it allows us to do is sort of 
tag every new feature that we build inside of Wufoo and timestamp it and also have a link to sort of a blog post that talks about how that feature is utilized. And then when the user logs in, what we look at is the last time that they logged in and see what are the 10 features that have been implemented since then and then show them to the user. And so each one is customized. This is the most valuable piece of real estate inside of Wufoo for an engineer in our company. If you want to do something significant and you want users to be able to use it, then you have to go through some hurdles as, uh, for us in order to get into the internal alert system. And basically that is write the documentation. You do it, and then your software is probably going to get used because it will get exposed. There will be marketing efforts set to it, and then you will understand what it's like to have people love the things you built and not have to uh, support it for every little thing that goes wrong. The last thing I wanted to go with that has less to do with documentation but also helps with the culture of getting people to understand and just get into a place where they should know that writing docs is the right thing to do. And that is that in our company, in addition to having everyone support the people that pay their paycheck, we make everyone thank the people that pay their paycheck. And so what we had is every single week that we got together inside of our company, we wrote handwritten thank you cards to the people uh, that were our customers. And these cards are not fancy. These are cardboard strips with dinosaur stickers on them. <laughs> they say thanks, and then just that heartfelt message. And it just gets people into the process of writing to uh, customers and appreciating them and understanding that ultimately that they can't do what they do, which is build awesome things for them without their sort of continued help and support. And this sort of weekly reminder makes all the difference. Because... Um, Writing documentation takes a little bit of humility. It takes a little bit of understanding that the thing I built is not going to be perfect, right? And so I'll need some sort of cushion and insurance, to sort of make sure that the thing I built will have the greatest amount of clarity possible, even if it's not self-evident. That's the end of my talk. Thank you very much. Again, I will tweet a link to all these slides here, so uh, don't worry about trying to get have access to them. Any questions? So do you have any advice for a company that, you know, has employees that might kind of be thinking this way, but they've kind of drifted off course or something, you know, where they're, there's definitely a, a culture of it, but it isn't the perva like pervading culture, say? I got you. Yeah, so one of the things is I created this presentation and built this sort of methodical argument out so that you'd have the arsenal that you need to sort of explain things on every sort of way that you can think of like why this should be done. It makes you a better programmer. It's useful to the bottom line. It doesn't affect the kind of clients that you're going to attract. It doesn't make you worse at what you do. Doesn't, it, it's not beneath you, and humility is a great aspect to sort of have in terms of like building things. Um, you start with little things, so part of it is just explaining all the research that I have here and, and give it to them and let them know that there's tons of examples of companies doing this. I mentioned Kayak, but Craigslist, FreshBooks, Amazon, Rackspace, all of those companies are support driven. They believe in doing customer support and they expose all of their engineers to customer support at some aspect of their sort of um, employment line. And therefore, um, you know, there's tons of great examples of why this works and works really well. Uh, back here. So I work for, here, I work for I GitHub. I can't see, so I'm just going to pretend. Ah, okay. <laughs> I work for GitHub and one of the things that, to answer his question, one of the things we did is every new employee has to do a week of, at least a week to two weeks of support when they first get hired on so they kind of see what's going on. And number two, to hand, how we got the developers doing it, we actually inst instituted something called King of Developers, and that person for that week that they're on King of Developers, they don't do any of their normal projects. All they do is support the support team, you know, with handling bugs, handling anything else, and it's a consistent thing. It's a new person each week, and they get to see all these things, and they do fix all these things that come up as they come up. And it's worked really well for us. We've been doing it for almost a year now. And it's the developers saying it's get them a chance to see what's going on better and kind of be more in tune with what's going on with users. And then when they go back to their normal duties, I, you know, you'll still see them. They're still working on those things. They, they kind of take ownership of those bugs and get them fixed. Yep. 
And he's totally legit. I was just looking over his shoulder. He's in his support chat room right now. <laughs> Any more questions? Oh, yeah, OK. Yeah, I would just like to echo that. I mean, at my company, we do support with the developers. And it's actually like really good. Like, I didn't think that I would like that, but you really do learn how people are using your software and you appreciate it. So it might be an easier sell than you think. Yeah, nothing hurts a trial. The other thing is, like, I think a lot of teams are, should easily buy into building cross-functional teams to build out the feature of different parts of your product. And so I highly encourage that if you're not doing so already, have some liaison from the customer support side or even the technical writing side be part of the product development process. We have one at SurveyMonkey that been applied to us. And in the beginning of us building out the features, that person is going to be a little lost in terms of like the nuts and bolts of building out the features. But by the time we get closer to sort of launch and such, that sort of inherent knowledge that they sort of gobbled up um, through osmosis makes all the difference in terms of helping us get to a successful launch. Um, what, what sparked your interest in like support driven development and like, what were some of the the easiest ways to to get a developer that you were interviewing or bringing on to have that same enthusiasm for this? Uh, yeah. So basically, in the first couple of years, it was just the founders, and so someone had to do customer support, and so no one founder thought it was fair to do all of it because we were all sort of technical in building it. So we split it evenly. And in the beginning, we griped about it. And over time, we became converters in terms of that we realized, like, holy crap, this is really making us a whole lot better than we thought. When we won 2008 from Jacob Nielsen, it was only the three founders uh, at the time. We didn't have a team. And um, you know, coming into my startup, doing the, all the user experience th design and stuff, you think as a designer, especially young sort of hotshot designers, you think, I have all the answers. I know how the world should be reconfigured so that it is optimal. And then once you start seeing people like, just have basic problems with just like, I don't understand how to log in because you like put the login link in a weird place that you thought would be cute. Um, once you hit that and answer that over and over and over again, it sets in a sort of humility that lets you know that you don't have all the answers and then that support that's coming in is like the missing piece of what makes software really, really great. Um, in terms of getting all our other engineers to come aboard, we had been doing it for two years. And when we hired them, we laid down the rules. We said, we are extremely profitable. This is how things are working. And this is what the culture that we're having. Don't worry, you're not going to be the only ones doing customer support. We'll be doing it right alongside you. And so by leading by example, that helped a lot. But also, um, being a founder, like they had to do it or they wouldn't get hired. So that's like helps a lot. Um, but we also built it into the performance reviews. People would have a customer support review as part of their performance review. So in, including all the goals and stuff that they had set up and all their scrums and weekly meetings, we also would take a random day of their customer support that they answered. And then we just hammer through it and just say like, in a very detailed way, what did you do right? What did you do wrong? Where did you mess up? What could you have done better? And we do it in a very detailed way to let them know that this is important. And we do it three times a year. OK, any more questions up, up here? Oh, I see one hand up here. OK, great. In terms of uh, having developers do support, uh, we had two issues with that. And one is that uh, our support team said, oh, well, we develop relationships with our customers. We don't want to confuse them by rotating people in and out. So how do you handle that? And another issue is how do you handle it with developers who are really segmented? So like you might have a PL SQL developer who's very focused on database development. And you get somebody who's a Java developer, and they really don't understand the big picture. Yeah. So. Um Go to the first part of that. 90% uh, of customer support is just answering questions. Like, not how to do something or debugging an issue or what have you. It is just literally someone has a question of, can I do this or how do I do that, right? And so a lot of it is just simply going through the process. And we have lots of tools that make, make that really easy to do. We have text expanders that have all these snippets that are pre-written. And so there's no excuse why they can't do 90% of the work. For the 10%, that's for the debugging. You can assign it to other people. But sometimes it's just nice to have other people's eyes and ears. Like, 
seeing the problem, and they might have a surprising way of sort of answering things. In regards to building out relationships, we, don't, we never had dedicated people um, to do any kind of customer support. Any person can pick up a support ticket because th there's a history trail that's left at, at, for every single ticket that's sort of set up, so anybody should be able to pick it up. Um, basically, if you do the same sort of, sort of support training in terms of uh, courtesy, response, tone, et cetera, you do it with all the different kinds of people, they shouldn't have any problems dealing with this stuff. If, if they're the kind of person that can't treat someone well, one-on-one, -on -one, when they're having a problem, um, we have some tips and tricks that we give them. One of them is we have a picture of Jessica Alba for the guys. We have a picture of Brad Pitt for the girls. And we just say, hey, just imagine this is this person asking you for the problem, and how would you react to that? And they're a little bit, a whole lot nicer in terms of tone. The other thing, <laughs> is that they're at the wrong company. If they don't feel like they're above just helping sort of people and can do it in a way that sort of picks up where someone else left it off. So I think it's, it's pretty easy to do. And, and, and our users have never had a problem. No one has ever said that I get such bad customer support because multiple people have sort of interacted with me. It turns out because there's a trail and everyone reads the trail, uh, it's pretty consistent. Can you explain how you do A-B testing? Uh, A-B testing for the customer support, or the documentation, or the product? Yeah, like if you give them, well, I guess it wouldn't be the wrong content, but um, some of your users are going to be having different content than other users, so how do you sort of... There's tons of tools for handling that. Um, we had a simple internal one, but there's like so many cool ones out now. Um, you can do basic one-on-one -on -one user testing at usertesting.com, but there's also uh, Optimizely is a really great website for helping change those stuff. Uh, at SurveyMonkey, at its scale, we have a hardware platform for doing A-B testing. It's called SiteSpec. Um, and all it does is, the way we set it up is we might do multiple iterations of a design so that what you have is you change a class name and it changes how the design looks. In terms of content, then what we need to do is split the link that is set up. But that's pretty much how it's set up. And then you just kind of look at it and we have because we're SurveyMonkey, lots of hardcore methodologists and statisticians can let us know when it's statistically significant in terms of the change and increase in, in improvements. Okay, thanks so much. Awesome.